Our final look at what a patient is brings in all of the other things that are living in the patient. And we can see the difference they make when we look at their developmental origins. So now we'll look at the developmental origins of the microbiota. A patient is actually a complex community with an ancient coevolutionary history. A patient consists of about 10 trillion human cells, about 90 trillion bacteria, plus uncounted viruses and fungi, and contains at least 300 times as many unique microbial genes as human genes. C-sections, breastfeeding, antibiotic treatments, and hygiene all affect the microbiota and through their interactions with the immune system also affect the risk of allergies, asthma, obesity, and autoimmune disease. The evidence of coevolution is actually co-development. The gut is the largest immune organ, and the development of gut-associated lymphoid tissue, GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, is triggered by signals produced by gut bacteria. One of those is salmonella. The mammal genome has outsourced this essential function. Experiments on azenic infant rabbits, that is, infant rabbits that do not contain any bacteria, have demonstrated that you have to have bacteria in the gut to develop the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and this, they need to be there in the first week of life. In the infant rabbits, bacterioides fragilis is one of the agents that's involved. Then, as the organism and its microbiota continue to develop, there is crosstalk between the microbiota and the immune system, and that helps to maintain immunological balance. So this is the role of the immune system in managing the microbiota, not just in defending against pathogens, but managing the microbiota. Mutations in nod receptors, which recognize pathogen-associated molecules, are a significant risk for Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. So if you interrupt this communication, between the microbiota and the immune system, it can induce a disease state in the patient. If we look at what the gut looks like in a fetus and in a postnatal infant, the first thing that you can see by comparing these diagrams is that the gut lumen fills up with bacteria, but it also fills up with molecules which are being secreted by cells that are in, by specialized cells that are in the gut wall. So the MAMPs are microbe associated molecular patterns. These are communicating then with the gut wall. Payers patches are lymphoid nodules that surround the ileum. Here is a Payers patch. Here is a Payers patch. The panath cells are secreting antimicrobial compounds into the gut lumen. Here is a panath cell. Here are antimicrobial peptides. And immunoglobulin A, IgA, is the major immunoglobulin in gut mucus. So there is a lot of immunoglobulin A in the gut mucus. So a communication system is set up between the host and the complex community of microbiota. The gut epithelium is protected by an inner mucus layer that is nearly sterile. This is astonishing because there is such a huge density of bacteria in the gut. But the layer that's right next to the gut epithelium is nearly sterile. The gut microbiota live in the outer mucus layer and in the gut lumen. So this is the small intestine here. This is the large intestine here. These blue dots that you see blue and, and green are bacteria. The panath cells are producing antimicrobial peptides. The goblet cells are producing the mucus. And that combination of mucus and antibacterial peptides is protecting the gut epithelium. But it's also creating a gut lumen in which the bacteria can flourish. So the signals from the bacteria can also get through into the gut epithelium. That microbiota develops across at least two generations. 
So before pregnancy begins, the maternal environment is affecting her microbiota and her own genes are affecting her microbiota. She is exposed to different bacteria and she develops her own gut community. Then in utero, during her pregnancy, whether or not she's stressed or smoking or what kind of food she is eating, uh, what sorts of other factors might be affecting her placenta, can all affect her own microbiota. And then during delivery, the delivery method determines which particular ecosystem of bacteria gets transferred to the infant. So vaginal delivery versus cesarean is very important whether or not antibiotics are being used perinatally. So if the mother is given antibiotics before she delivers, that will perturb her community. The mode of feeding, breast milk versus formula, and the initial colonization of the gastrointestinal tract. So it can be shown that children that are born by cesarean have a gut community that is more similar to their mother's skin, whereas those that are born vaginally have a gut community more similar to their mother's gut. Then in early infancy, the infant diet, which includes introduction of potential allergens and infections, will also cause shifts in the microbiota found in the baby. And if the infant is exposed to smoke in the environment, that will also influence this. So these all combine to determine the state of the immune system, its ability in the infant to resist disease, and also the ability of the infant's immune system to manage its own microbiota. Here are some of the data. So we know that C-sections increase the risk of asthma. And atopy is a hypersensitive allergic reaction that's mediated by immunoglobulin E. It usually has a genetic basis that interacts with exposure to the allergen. Atopies include eczema, hay fever, allergic conjunct conjunctivitis, and allergic asthma. Vaginal delivery leads to an initial colonization by aerobic E. coli and streptococcus followed by anaerobic bacteroides, clostridium, and bifidobacterium within the first two weeks. Bifidobacteria play a role in the maturation of the secretion of immunoglobulin A in saliva which may protect against allergy. Caesarean delivery leads to a much more frequent colonization by Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Clostridium. Children born by C-section had a 20% increased risk of asthma and a slight increase in risk of atopy and allergy. So, delivery method makes a difference. What about obesity? C-sections appear to double the risk of obesity in three-year-old children. So here, our data on percentage of children on the y-axis and the bars are representing either vaginal or cesarean birth. These are the percentages that were overweight and these are the percentages that were obese. And you can see that cesarean born children have just about twice the risk of being obese as do vaginally born children. Breastfeeding also reduces the risk of atopic disorders. So children with and without atopies have different gut microbiomes. Breastfed infants are colonized with fewer E. coli, C. difficile, and bacteroides than formula-fed infants. And breastfeeding has to, in, has to continue for at least three months to produce these effects and to provide protection against atopies. So this particular study uh, followed about 1,200 children for about four years. And I'll just focus your attention on this part of the table here. You can see if we contrast method of feeding with formula on the top line and breastfeeding on the bottom line, that the frequency of asthma, eczema, rhinitis, and food allergy is lower for breastfeeding for all of these different atopies. Now, breastfeeding may be reducing the risk of obesity, and here is a hypothesis on how that might work. It is thought that breast milk is supporting bifidobacteria and increasing folate. Infant formula is supporting firmicutase bacteria and increasing butyrate. 
The breast milk thereby promotes DNA methylation and the infant formula is promoting histone acetylation. They are affecting gene transcription in different ways with long-term effects on metabolism target genes and that might lead to permanent metabolic changes. So the mechanism, if this is true, is epigenetic and it might be mediated by continuing differences in gut flora that could be treated with probiotics. So one of the hopes for obese people actually is that they could be treated simply by eating particular kinds of bacteria in their food. Dealing with the epigenetic mechanisms is not so easy to manipulate. We also know that antibiotic therapy increases the risk of atopies and obesity. So any course of antibiotics before the age of two years doubled the risk of hay fever and eczema in a UK study. Here you see that doubling of risk right here between these two sets of lines. And early use of antibiotics increased the risk of obesity slightly but significantly in humans. So here the antibiotics are being given in this gray bar period and the risk of obesity is going up in the group that was exposed to antibiotics and is a bit lower in the ones that were not exposed. Later exposures did not increase the risk of obesity. So atopies and obesity both appear to be conditions that are being mediated by the microbiota. We can see the impact of hygiene and on the overall complexity and size of the microbial community by contrasting people who are living in Karelia, which is now in Russia, and living in Finland. They have similar genetic backgrounds, but they're living in very different economic and cultural situations. The people who are living in Finland have much greater incidence of type 1 diabetes than the people who are living in Karelia. And if we look at the rates of Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, the people who are living in Finland have about four times as high a rate of Crohn's disease as do those in Finland. And look at the other correlates. People in Karelia have 73% uh, incidence of Helicobacter, those in Finland only 5%. People in Karelia have about $1,600 a year income, those in Finland about $2,500 a year. And 73% of the people in Karelia have cats, only 36% in Finland. <coughs> so there are similar differences between the two areas in hepatitis A, toxoplasma, enteroviruses, and gut nematodes. So the take home from this slide is that a dramatic contrast of neighboring geographic regions that differ quite a bit in their hygiene indicates that they also differ a lot in autoimmune disease, both type 1 diabetes and Crohn's disease. So what are the mechanisms that might mediate this sort of response, which we're going to go into in greater detail? The first is just competition. So the infectious agents could be eliciting strong immune responses that compete with the weaker responses that are elicited by allergens and autoantigens. Second, it could be regulation. So one antigen's suppressive effect also suppresses immune responses to other antigens. That's bystander suppression. So infectious agents could stimulate regulatory cells to dampen autoimmune and allergic responses. The third is innate immunity. Infectious agents could activate the innate immune system by generating tolerogenic dendritic cells that activate tolerogenic T regulatory cells. So this would be a more active manipulation of signaling pathways. To summarize, the development and expression of our immune system have co-evolved with our microbiome. Interventions that perturb our microbiome change the risk of atopies, autoimmune diseases, and obesity. These interventions include C-sections rather than vaginal delivery, formula rather than breast milk, and antibiotic treatments early in life, as well as hygiene in general. The result is mismatch, diseases of civilization caused by the inability of biology to evolve as rapidly as culture.